Actually, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Mike Petrilli. I'm the Executive Vice President at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. For those of you who haven't been here before or who are tuning in from home for the first time, uh, we are one of the nation's leading education policy think tanks. Uh, we do think tank stuff here in Washington, D.C., and we also do on-the-ground education reform work in the great state of Ohio, where our hometown is, Dayton to be exact, uh, including sponsoring uh, charter schools, which we're very proud to do. Uh, we're very happy to be sponsoring this event today with the American Institutes for Research uh, and appreciate their support. Uh, they provided the lunch uh, that people are enjoying here today. And please, uh, those of you here in the audience, don't be bashful about getting some more. We have a fantastic discussion on board today, and it's about a topic that is getting a, a lot of uh, a lot of attention, as it should be, which is the attention of how do we make sure that more kids have access to great teachers. Now, of all the education reforms that are out there right now, at least the big ones, I would argue that, that the teacher effectiveness reforms, uh, these are the ones that tend to get most into inside that black box of what's happening in our schools. You know, you think about standards-based reform, which has been going strong now for 20 years, and, and now, of course, we're very focused on the Common Core, as the, the latest uh, incantation of that. And, and, and this is, though, still fairly big picture. I mean, it, it is meant to have an impact on things like instruction and curriculum, but it's just an indirect impact. These are the standards, not the curriculum that schools are expected to meet. Likewise, with school choice, charter schools, uh, private school vouchers, other kinds of school choice, uh, these reforms are meant to make it possible for educators to do to do things differently, to provide greater autonomy, to give parents choices among different kinds of schools. But they don't, you know, the, the reform itself, the, uh, you know, passing a law saying we're going to allow charter schools, it doesn't get into the heart and matter of the classroom or of instruction itself. It maybe makes some of those things possible, but it doesn't get at it directly. But the teacher evaluation reforms, the teacher effectiveness reforms, these reforms do go straight to the heart of the matter. Uh, and for better or for worse, uh, what we see now across the country are policymakers saying, we want to do uh, our, our human resource systems differently. Uh, first and foremost, there has been great interest in moving away from what the New Teacher Project called the widget effect, right? Where we used to just pretend that every teacher was exactly the same. Every math teacher, every English teacher, that their effectiveness was the same, we will pay them the same, we will treat them the same. Uh, and, and their argument was that, of course, this is not the case. As with any other human endeavor, there is going to be a range of effectiveness. There are going to be some fantastic teachers. There are going to be some teachers who are going to struggle. And there's going to be a lot of teachers in between. And we should figure out uh, which teachers are which and treat them differently. Right? So this is what all the attention around teacher evaluation has been about. What is the smartest way to try to differentiate among teachers? Looking at test scores as one part of it, but also principal observations, other observations, student surveys, so on and so forth. Once you do it, once you find a way to say these teachers are our best teachers and these teachers are the struggling ones, then the big questions are, what do we do with that information? Right? Big court case going on right now in California, the Ver Vergara trial, uh, saying that we should be able, for example, to remove ineffective teachers from the classroom, even if they have tenure. Right, big debates about that. Also, part of the trial is saying that if we're not able to do that, it is going to be low-income and minority kids who are going to have uh, the, the worst chances of getting high-quality teachers. They're going to be most likely to be stuck with those teachers that we have discovered are not uh, as effective as they need to be. Uh, people also interested in, in different kinds of compensation reform. If we have figured out who our best teachers are, uh, and we know that they can add tremendous value to their students, but we also know that they are at least as likely, if not more likely, to leave the classroom after just a few years. What can we do to hang on to those teachers? Do we need to pay them more? Uh, do we need to uh, reward them in other ways? And then, of course, there's a big debate about equity and distribution. Uh, there's a big story in Ed Week just this week saying that any day now, there's going to be some, some new action coming, Lord help us, uh, from the U.S. Department of Education uh, to ask states to make sure that they do not have an inequitable distribution of these effective teachers, right, to try to look at this teacher effectiveness gap. All right, so a lot of attention. One thing that hasn't gotten as much attention, though, is a, a very simple idea that says once we have differentiated among teachers and identified our strongest ones, what if we gave them different class sizes than the norm? 
I mean, class size is one of those things that we debate at the macro level all the time, huge debates about whether we should spend money to lower class sizes. But the assumption has almost always been that whatever the number you end up on, uh, every teacher is going to have more or less the same class size. And that is more or less how schools do it. That is seen as the way to be equitable towards teachers. It's fair. It wouldn't be unfair to burden some teachers with huge class sizes and others with smaller class sizes. Uh, and it's also the way to make sure that parents aren't upset. Everybody gets the same number of kids. But a few, uh, a few smart folks, uh, folks like Marguerite Rosa, Rick Hess, uh, Bill Gates, uh, others over the years have started to say, what if we uh, took this information, differentiated among teachers, and started to, to take action based on that when it came to class size? What if we let class sizes vary and found ways to get the, the best teachers to have larger classes? Would that have a positive impact on achievement? Well, that question interested us at Fordham. And so we turned uh, to Mike Hansen at AIR to help us figure out the answer to that question. And Mike is part of the, he's part of the Calder team, which I'm not going to remember what that stands for, but something impressive about longitudinal data. Uh, he has access to great data, especially in North Carolina. And he did a fantastic paper for us that's on our website uh, that looks at this question about right-sizing the classroom and trying to look at what what would the impacts be if we allowed class sizes to vary in this way? Could we raise student achievement? Mike is going to give a presentation today, not to exceed 12 minutes, right? <laughs> uh, to, and I've already given all the, the lead up to it. So, I mean, you can get right into the data, right? Not to exceed 12 minutes about what he found uh, in a simulation he did with real live data based on real live uh, students and classroom compositions. What could the impact be? And then we're going to have a great discussion about these findings, about uh, should we, in fact, take this information and now try to get schools uh, to change the way that they do class sizes. And we're, of course, going to have an opportunity for all of you here in the audience to participate. And also those of you watching uh, from home or from your office, please participate, especially on Twitter. Our hashtag is hashtag teacher access. Uh, you'll see me looking at my phone. I'm not checking my email at least not usually, but what I am doing is following the Twitter debate, and we'll definitely try to get the folks on Twitter to become a part of this discussion. Now, I should also say, we know that we have some competition today, and at Fordham, we believe in competition. All right, some of you at home or at your office might be tempted to watch the USA versus Canada women's hockey game, to which I have a couple things to say. First of all, shame on you for watching sports during the workday. I mean, that's just really not okay. And, and we would never at Fordham, by the way, use these big screen TVs to watch March Madness, for example. So that, that is just <laughs> off limits. Second of all, it's hockey. How can you possibly see the puck on your computer screen, right? <laughs> Save it for later, people. Save it for later. Finally, I will say, though, if you are tempted to watch the hockey game, we will try to make sure that this panel is, is as exciting as possible. I have encouraged people to throw some sharp elbows. All right, a little bit of blood would be OK. And if, if somebody is particularly boring, they will get sent to the penalty box. And they will be forced to tweet their comments for the rest of the conversation. Fair enough? All right. Uh, so Mike will come up in a moment. Uh, actually, let's do that now. And then uh, when he's done, I will introduce our other fantastic panelists. So please welcome Mike Hansen from AIR. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. So should we need to pull this up? Here we go. <clears throat> so many states and school districts across the country are still reeling from historic shortfalls in education budgets and they due to the Great Recession and they are still continuing to deal with fallout from the cuts made over the last several years. One common focal point to cut costs has been for many jurisdictions to step back from prior commitments they made to limiting class size in their school districts. And some locales are actively still considering whether, whether the benefits of small classes actually justify the significant cost of those. However, as I will demonstrate over the next few minutes, the phrase larger classes need not be considered a euphemism for harming our kids' educational prospects. I'm excited to be with you today to present my work on right-sizing the classroom. In short, this paper says that if we mine the research evidence from both class size and from effective teachers, and we, can, we use that when we divvy up students into classes, then our classroom configurations might look a little different than what we actually observe in practice today. And it's quite possible that if we were more intentional about how we allocated our students to the strongest teachers, and perhaps uh, reducing the class sizes of some of those weaker teachers, we may be, we may be able to make large strides in educational outcomes. 
So first, let's take a look at what the typical method of classroom allocation looks like. And so here we have a, a number of kids, and they're evenly arrayed into four different classrooms. Under, in general, this is considered a fair approach, where all teachers are, are shouldering an equal burden of students. However, the method that I'm going to be examining here for this uh, presentation, it's uh, sometimes referred to as class size shifting. And this intentionally gives more students to the teachers that we expect to perform better, and fewer students to the teachers that we expect to not be doing as well. Okay? Under this model, we can consider class size to reflect how a teacher is going to be expected to perform. Okay? Now, while this approach may come into direct conflict with the widely popular uh, support for universally reducing class sizes in this country, the rationale behind it is actually justified based on uh, research evidence. Here you see a very cursory overview of the two strands of literature on teacher quality on the left and class size on the right. On the teacher quality side of the ledger, what we see uh, across multiple contexts are large impacts on students, on student outcomes, both on learning and then on future outcomes in terms of graduating high school, college attendance, et cetera. And we see these impacts come from a variety of contexts, uh, so across grades and subjects, et cetera. Now, these results do vary in their magnitude, but they're there. On the class size side of the ledger, the results are a little more mixed. And in general, these uh, impacts are relatively small. Okay, and, and in some contexts, they're maybe even close to zero. Now, the best evidence that we have on this topic comes from the Tennessee Star experiment, where it does say that there are sizable gains to attributable to these smaller classes, but these gains are largest in the lowest elementary grades. So this is kindergarten, grades one, two, and three. And it appears that the largest gain is due to a student's first time being exposed to a small class. And it's not a cumulative effect. It doesn't keep going every time that they are subsequently exposed year after year. Okay, so this is an important nuance to keep in mind. So, um, so if we were to try to uh, put these two findings together and try to, com try to compare the magnitudes of these two, what we would see is that a good teacher, somebody around the 85th percentile of classroom performance, may be able to induce an additional quarter to a half year of learning in their students, while, uh, but in order to get an equivalent increase in learning through class size alone, it may take a reduction of up to 10 to 20 students. Of course, this, the numbers vary depending on how we're estimating it, et cetera. But if this gives you a, a, an appreciation for the size of the difference between these two. So what this could, should suggest to us is that if we were to focus on, on teacher quality rather than universally lowering class size, there is a window of opportunity here. And we economists, we call this an arbitrage opportunity. And that kind of makes us uh, drool a little bit. And so we're chomping at the bit here. So uh, go with me now. Um, so we're going to talk about the data and methods. And just a very brief overview. I'm using North Carolina data to conduct a simulation here. Um, I'm looking at grades 5 and 8, math, reading, and science test scores. I'm using four years of data. The first three years of data are used to estimate teachers' performance using value-added measures. Um, <clears throat> then. I'm focusing specifically on schools where students actually can be reallocated across teachers. This is a necessary criterion in order to uh, conduct, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to conduct this uh, strategy. And so, and this actually occurs in about 90 in, in about the 90% of schools where stu or excuse me, approximately 90% of students are in schools where this is possible. Okay. Finally, I'm doing two things with the 2010-11 school year. I'm calling this my target year. Uh, for, the, for the purpose of the study. And I'm doing two things. First, I'm documenting what sorting actually looks like in that 2010-11 school year for the, to begin with. And then I'm also trying to manipulate the class, the, how these classes are assigned across teachers and seeing what gains can be made by doing this manipulation. OK? So this, uh, first, this first slide gives you the results of what that target year assignment looks like. OK, so we have six uh, analysis samples. These are corresponding to grades uh, 5 and 8 in math, reading, and science. And the first measure that you see in this table is the, the class size deviation within a school. That is, what is, on average, how large is the largest classroom compared to the mean within that school and grade? OK, so the important takeaway message here is that there already is some deviation in class size 
that I observe in, in the data. Okay? So it's not large, but it's on the order of about two to three students in grade five. It's on the order of about five, four to five students in grade eight. Okay? The second thing to note here is the within school correlation of the expected teacher performance and class size. So what this, this is a, a metric that can range from zero to one. Zero being no relationship between teacher effectiveness and class size, and one would be a perfect mirror, right? So what we see here is that all these values are slightly larger than zero. Okay, so they're positive, but not very, not very positive, not very large. So what this means is that there is a slight tendency to have slightly more students with the teachers that we expect more out of. Okay, another way to quantify this same thing is to look at the proportion of students actually directly assigned to the top 25% of teachers. Okay, so the top 25% of teachers here is based on their prior value added. And if you look at the, <clears throat> the top row of measures, you see these numbers are hovering slightly above 25%. Okay, so approximately 25% of our kids are, are matched with our top 25% of teachers. Okay, now also on this same slide, in that second row, I have the proportion of students that are eligible for free and reduced price lunch. These are, this is our measure of poverty in the, in the uh, data. And what we see is that there is a, probably about a two percentage point difference between the overall access and how, how many, and the access for those uh, free and reduced price lunch students. Okay? So, this is, so there is a gap in access that is apparent in the data already. And an important note here is that the strategic assignment, the, the strategic assignment policy I'm describing here, this is really only addressing the within school inequitable distribution of teachers. It does not address the across school inequitable distribution. So this is an important nuance. And so now we will increase student access by doing this policy, but it's only going to improve it on that one dimension only. Okay. So let's look at what the results actually say here. I have six graphs here. Uh, these are corresponding to math, reading, and science across the columns, grades five and eight down the rows. The horizontal axis is, uh, it represents the number of students that are being shifted from the weaker teachers' classrooms into the, lar into the stronger teachers' classrooms. Okay, so these are additional students for the, for the better teachers. So on the left of each, of each graph, we're th you can think of this as equal class sizes. And as you move to the right, we're thinking of larger, uh, more disparate class sizes between the teachers. Okay? And the y-axis that you see here, this is representing gains in student learning on these test scores. And on all these six different dimensions, we see that the gains are positive as, as we sort more and more kids to be matched with the better teachers. Okay? Though it's hard to see the, the actual axis labels here, um, one thing I do want to note is that these results are particularly strong in the eighth grade, and they're considerably smaller in the fifth grade. Let me focus on the eighth grade first. Moving six, students in, um, moving six students into the classrooms of the better teachers is equivalent to approximately two weeks of additional learning for eighth grade math and science. Okay? The, the reason why I want to focus on this six students is because this is the level of variation in class sizes that we're already seeing in the data. And so we're actually not talking about a very large difference in the, the current practice of what the current practice of class sizes looks like, but we are talking about sorting them differently, okay? So, and also this is equivalent, this nearly two weeks here, this effect is equivalent to removing the bottom 5% of teachers from the workforce without actually removing them, okay? So this is an important thing. So, because that's one, that's one area of policy that, that uh, some, some reformers have been talking about, is that if we were to actually have some kind of quality control measure in place for the teacher workforce, and we remove the bottom X percent of teachers, that we'd be, able, we'd be much better off. And so this is equivalent to removing the bottom 5%. Okay? We could also think of this in terms of class size. This is actually equivalent to actually reducing, universally reducing class size by about four, five, or six students in these classes. Okay? That's an important uh, distinction to make. The, the gains for fifth grade are not nearly as large. They're roughly equ equal to about two additional days of learning. Why the difference? This is primarily related to the fact that a, a single subject teacher, so a math teacher in eighth grade, she is teaching, uh, he or she is teaching multiple students of larger classes or multiple classes of, of more students. Okay? So now 
the next thing I want to look at is whether the access or the access to effective teaching, how this is affected. Okay, and I have three measures of, of teacher access here. And so we have the proportion assigned to the top 25% of teachers in column one. This is our based on prior value added. In column two, we have the proportion assigned to teachers with or five or more years of experience. Column three as the proportion of teachers with a master's degree or more. And as you can see, all of these measures are improving as we assign more students into the teachers, into the classrooms of the better teachers. However, because we are sorting specifically on value added, of course, the value added has the larger change in that metric. Okay? However, it's important to also note that while free and reduced price lunch students do gain access in the absolute level, the relative gap between non-FRL and FRL students is actually still present. Okay? So the, these, the green and red lines, in other words, are roughly parallel across these different dimensions. Okay? And so the next thing we'd want to talk about is the, a teacher's willingness and, and how we compensate them. Generally, from what we see from surveys, parents and teachers are at least game to play the game, or at least in and willing to play the game. 83% um, of teachers would choose money over smaller classes. This is from a survey in Washington State. 73% of teachers, or, or excuse me, of parents could choose a top teacher over, uh, would choose having a top teacher with a slightly larger class rather than a regular teacher with a slightly smaller class. But now this raises the question is how would we reward these teachers so that the larger class is not a punishment for these teachers, right? Because this is additional work. So there's two ways we could do it. We could think of non-monetary means where we can provide additional aids, we could have some kind of career status attached to teaching a larger class. We can remove out of classroom work for these teachers. Or we could also, of course, go into the monetary way. And we can actually provide explicit bonuses for using money uh, from savings um, in different ways. So we can perhaps find savings by having fewer remedial teachers, uh, remedial instructors, or lowering pay for uh, teachers with the smaller classes. And I'm sure that's going to be a very popular one. Um, so finally, in conclusion here, the class size policy that I'm describing here, it has two, uh, two important conclusions. First off, this is an efficient uh, way of assigning, teach of, of assigning students to teachers. Okay? This class size shifting can make ed educationally significant improvements in student learning, especially in eighth grade. And, um, however, there is no change in equity. So, it's, so while it is if more efficient, it is not more equitable. Okay? So there is no relative improvement in student access to effective teachers. There is an absolute improvement, but no relative improvement. OK, of course, this raises some feasibility issues. We're talking about we have to change some laws governing class size uh, policies. It also could disrupt some dynamic among the teacher workforce. It raises issues about, um, about facilities. It raises issues about how we compensate these teachers. Um, I'm very welcome to opening the conversation about this. And I think this is a, a very fruitful way to go. And uh, so in conclusion, make some recommendations here. This paper is not prescribing how we should be assigning classes per se, um, nor is it suggesting that all schools should adopt these highest levels of sorting. However, what I am recommending is that we instead shift our focus when we're assigning classes. Instead of focusing on fairness to teachers, let's think about prioritizing student learning overall. Okay. Also, I opened the opportunity to experiment with different levels of sorting where these conditions allow and where we can learn about how we can compensate teachers fairly or not. Thank you very much. Very nicely done, Mike, and in plenty of time. That was, uh, that was excellent. No penalty box for you, at least not yet. All right, let, let me ask a few questions, and then we're going to bring in the panel. Uh, some of the things that you said, really interesting. So you did not find significant impacts in the fifth grade, but you did in the eighth grade. And then I just heard you say that this was related to the fact that eighth grade teachers teach many more students. So is just, I mean, is this just an artifact of the study that you had a larger sample size and therefore it's easier to find significant effects? Uh, I mean, in other words, for policymakers is the answer, well, only do this in middle school uh, and don't do it in elementary school. Or is this just something about the, the, the data itself? Help us understand that. That's a good question. Uh, first off, I do want to clarify your, your statement. Um, okay. So the, the finding is that there, these are significant gains in fifth grade. Okay. So an additional approximately two days of learning in fifth grade, and that is a statistically significant difference. However, the, the magnitude is not as large, and so therefore it's perhaps not as noteworthy. Or, or uh, you know, if we were to actually 
plot out the cost if we were to actually um, provide bonuses to teachers. If we were to uh, if we were to pay them a two thousand dollar bonus for each additional student the most effective teachers are getting, the the cost versus the benefit is it kind of it's it's neutral yeah. and so it's not it's not as strong. Now, so I don't see this as being um, an artifact of the statistics and the the sample size here. Okay, so that that is for real. That for some reason, uh, those those elementary school teachers are not uh, they, they don't uh, the, the kids don't benefit as much from having the more effective teachers that, as the eighth grade students do. Is that? that that's right. And the reason why they're not benefiting as much is. First off, we, they have fewer students exposed to those better teachers, right? So okay. in, in fifth grade, we have 20 students exposed to the better teacher, say. Right. Um, and or, or even if, we have, if we're allocating more, we're saying 26 or 28 students yeah. instead of 20. Um, however, if we're talking about allocating more students to an eighth grade teacher, that eighth grade teacher is now teaching four sections, say, yeah. of 28 students. Right. OK? Sure. So okay. That, that's multiplied across the, se the sections. There. Gotcha. OK. That's okay. very helpful. All right. Everybody get that? All right. um, maybe you got it the first time. I should send myself to the penalty box. Uh, <laughs> now, one of the things we're going to talk about with the panel is that this is a simulation. I mean, this is not, this hasn't, you know, you didn't study something that was happening in the real world. So, right. of course, we know that there's going to be, you know, it's going to play out differently with real live people. And, uh, and then some of the people have commented on that on the web. Bruce Baker, for example, uh, you know, has said, you know, this is, devoid of the context. So let's talk a little bit about how this would play out differently. You are looking at differentiating among teachers based solely on value added, right? In the real world, we would probably use the broader teacher evaluation, which would include principal observations. Do you have any sense of how that would likely uh, play out in terms of the impacts? Would they, I mean, do we think that would make the impacts greater, uh, not as great? What, what do you think? What's your sense on that? So my sense on that is that in general, we have these teacher evaluations, at least the evidence that's out there, is that the, the teacher evaluations that we would have are going to be somewhat less predictive of student test scores. Okay. But they will likely be more, more helpful, perhaps, on other dimensions aside from test scores. Right. Okay? So if we were to use other, other measures of teacher performance, which I'm only using teacher performance simply because those are the measures, or value-added measures, because those are the measures I have. Right. But in practice, if we had a more broader set, we could uh, use these for all teachers rather than just simply the ones in tested grades and subjects. And uh, we could get perhaps, perhaps the, the test grade or the, the test score outcomes may not be as large because value-added is generally your best predictor of future test scores. Right. However, we might be able to move the needle more on different outcomes. Okay. And one last question for you, Mike. One of my colleagues here at Fordham, Matt Richmond, had this idea, which was to say, you know, th this sounds so controversial to people, but what if you, you tweaked it a little bit and said, since we know that most first and second year teachers tend to be less effective than other teachers, what if you said, look, what this policy should be about is having those first or second year teachers have smaller classes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, as they're getting to both, you know, learn, and, and that might help them be more effective. And, you know, they're not damaging as many kids as they're kind of learning their their practice they're learning what they're doing and then the more better and the more experienced teachers would have larger classes and again and, and they're getting paid more so that i mean what if we were to model something like that knowing what you know about the relationship between experience and effectiveness i mean is that another way to get at, at something that would be pretty similar in terms of the outcome do you think absolutely uh, we would see we would still see I predict we'd still see some gains. Yep. The gains probably would not be quite as stark as what I've showed you here, at least not as stark as the um, fifth grade gain, or excuse me, the eighth grade gains, but maybe closer aligned to what we see in eighth grade. So there's still a gain. This is still significant. So this is an, an efficiency gain of, say, 2%, right? So an efficiency gain of 2%, yeah, it, maybe it sounds ho-hum to us, but this is, this is significant. That's actually approximately what we're talking about if we were to have a universal class size reduction of one or two students. Like that's that's the level of gain that we're talking about. But the class size class size reduction for one of two students costs a, a ton more money right. than um, than simply doing some small manipulations around you know the effective yeah. teachers or the the experienced teachers. And, and it's similar to firing the the worst teachers, right? The sort of lowest five percent of teachers, which you know is a, is something a lot of reformers are interested in, but as we know, is incredibly both politically challenging and disruptive, right? I mean, it, it creates all kinds of concerns and teacher morale problems when people feel like we're out to fire teachers. This might be a way to get just as 
strong results mm -hmm. uh, without going down that kind of controversial path. Sure. All right, so let's get our great panel in here for some more conversation. Uh, let me introduce you to them. First, we have Jean-Claude Brizard, who is a senior advisor at the College Board, former superintendent in Chicago, as well as Rochester. Uh, really great to have you back here, Jean-Claude. We have Linda donaldson Guidi, the instructional coach and teacher from Nashua, New Hampshire. As we said, constantly voted Nashua as one of the best places to live in America. Uh, but now Linda actually is, has just recently relocated to Washington, D.C. And, and brought the New Hampshire weather with her. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, and then finally, Brian Hassel, the co-director with his wife uh, at Public Impact, which is based in the Research Triangle, North Carolina, and is finally actually going to have an office. It's true. That is very exciting. So you can get stuck in traffic along with everybody else. That is exciting. All right. So let, let's get the conversation started by trying to make this real, all right, and, and help us all think through, again, this was a simulation, which it, it helps us understand things in very interesting ways, but it has its limitations. Uh, yeah, just so I'm curious uh, to, to all of you, how do you think this would play out in the real world? So Jean-Claude, for example, if you, if you had said in Chicago or Rochester, maybe to some set of schools, hey, we'd like you to experiment with this, uh, you know, here's the, some evidence that this might help. How do you think this would have gone down? You know, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, first, first of all, the first thing I thought about when I read this was, one, where do I sign up? Um, um, two, how do I train my principals to really understand how to create a master schedule that would make sense for their students, right? Um, so when I was a principal, uh, we did things like, if I had a teacher I was documenting to terminate, that person was the last one we filled in terms of classroom. We did everyone, everyone else, and that person was last. And if any parent complained, the student was pulled from that classroom. So we did that in a way perhaps that was not as scientific. But frankly, if we could find ways to, one, uh, go back to what you said, Mike, um, create the conditions for school leaders to create the most effective uh, master schedule to allow the best teachers to have those students the kinds of structures around compensation, around teacher willingness. And of course, we know that teaching is quite complex. So to understand who we have in our schools and to allow those people to allocate appropriately it would be terrific for schools across the country. And, and we have the survey data that seem to indicate that teachers are open to this idea if they're compensated, of course. We say, look, you know, would you rather have a, a smaller class size or a significantly higher salary? And, and te many teachers will say the higher salary but, you know, sometimes people say something on a survey that doesn't play out the same way in real life. I mean, how do you imagine that pitch would have gone if you, you're pitching this to teachers? Uh, what's your sense? Is this something uh, so teachers I'll, would be open I'll, to? I'll use Chicago as an example. Um, because they loved all of the reforms in yeah, Chicago. Of those, those, all of those reforms but went you, over really If you take a look at the surveys that came out recently on teacher evaluation in Chicago, teachers loved it. Because for the first time, they have some agency in their profession. They have some way of this sort of dual accountability with, with, with the school leader. Yeah. But in talking to nearly 20,000 teachers um, over the past few years, I can tell you that the idea of, of differential pay, the idea of agency, yeah. is important to teachers. Um, but again, they want to be uh, respected. They want to have some say in what they do. They don't want some bureaucrat giving them 28 or 40 students. Um, but if you have a school leader who really understands the culture and and has a relationship and has the data and the research behind them, mm -hmm. this can be very, very powerful for a school and teachers, I think, would be really open to it. Yeah. And my understanding is that many contracts have provisions to say if, if a teacher, if a school has to assign more than the contract allows in terms of class size, the teacher gets compensated extra for that. So, you know, there is some precedence for doing this, although not necessarily based on performance, but just right. All right, well, let's get the teacher voice in here, Linda. You are fresh from the classroom. What do you think? How, how would something like this play out in the schools that you've worked in? Um, just starkly as a model, I think that it would cause a lot of disruption in terms of morale. It, it, it comes in as a top-down reform. But one of the things I really appreciate about Mike's paper is it gives us the opportunity to start to look at things a little differently. Um, and sort of says, this factory model we have of equal classrooms, maybe we can start to think differently. We're in a different time about learning. And it really opens up a conversation. So with my teacher hat on as a middle school teacher, I um, have to think back about something Carolyn Tomlinson's been saying for years. And Carolyn Tomlinson says that grouping needs to follow instruction. In other words, that the instruction and the, and the content at any given point of time 
should be what determines grouping. And I would maintain the people best to do that are the teachers on the ground. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a middle school teacher, give my team our 100 kids and let us figure out how to group and regroup as we're moving through our instructional year. Mm -hmm. If I'm an elementary teacher, give my grade level team our 100 kids and let us group and regroup as we move through instruction. Mm -hmm. And I think this paper opens up that conversation. So if it becomes a reform that empowers the profession, I think you'd see a ton of support. You know, and that's interesting how you talk about grouping because, you know, even talking about class size shifting, we're still assuming that the model is the teacher with a group of whether it's 20 or 30 kids, whereas a lot of these newer models of blended learning and other things are, are constantly changing the size and configuration of groups, right? So you might have some class where 50 kids are together doing something. So over here, some teachers are, I mean, I'm just saying, <laughs> all right, but I mean, all right, maybe I'm thinking about it. Just, uh, gym Tell class, you know, we're going to just throw them all in the gym and they're going to just run around so that we can give really, uh, you know, intense instruction to smaller groups. I mean, that, that you see some of these models where the, the, the size and configuration of these groups are shifting, not just throughout the year, but literally throughout the day. Right. Uh, and, and so this does start to open up some of these things. Brian, I mean, we, we talk about this being something kind of hypothetical, but you have been doing a lot of work with your opportunity culture initiative where you've been looking at this question how do we get more kids uh, to have an you know, well let's how do we have our best teachers to have a greater impact on more kids uh, and so you see some schools out there experimenting with stuff like this uh, are people trying this this class size shifting what are you seeing well we, we've seen a lot we've, we've been working in schools in about uh, three or four districts now to think about how to give more kids access to great teachers. And I think what we found both in, in thinking about this hypothetically as Mike did, but also in working with teacher design teams, is that there are lots of ways that schools can expose their kids to more great teachers aside from just class size shifting. That's one, one model that, that we talk about on our website, opportunityculture.org. But there are lots of other approaches that, that you could take. And just to give three quick examples, one is multi-classroom leadership, where a great teacher takes responsibility for a team of other teachers and leads instruction for a large number of students that way. Another one is specialization, where teachers focus on the subject or the role that they do best and do that with more students, but within normal sized classes. And then finally, uh, the idea of a time swap, where kids spend part of their day, a small part probably on digital learning or doing some kind of homework at school or other activity. And during that time, probably supervised by a paraprofessional, the teachers can be with other students. But again, with normal sized groups, normal sized classes. And so I, I think the way we've seen this play out in, in schools in Charlotte and Nashville is teachers, when they come together, think we might incre increase class sizes a little bit. But mainly, we want to think about how to be more expansive in our vision, reconfigure roles more, more significantly, keep class sizes pretty normal, but give more kids access to great teachers. So, but where is, I mean, but are you saying that there has been then some resistance fundamentally to the idea of, you know, so, you know teacher A ends up with more kids than teacher B? I'd say there's been some resistance to that if, it's, if it means just putting more kids in the room at the same time. Now, yeah. the, these schools that we're working with, are exposing, ha having great teachers take more students under their responsibility, but often by having them spend part of the day down the hall learning in a digital lab and then coming part of the day to be with the teacher. The teacher has more students, right. takes responsibility for more students, but often in groups that they find manageable and, and sensible. And Linda, what about this idea of saying, look, in, instead of getting into this controversial issue around looking at value added or for, just doing it based on experience, we're going to make sure that the, the first and second year teachers have smaller classes because we know they're still learning. How would that go over here? I think it would be a model that would be very well accepted. In fact, I had that in my notes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm really enthusiastic about this idea. I think it would be a gift to young teachers and also to kids um, because class size does matter, Mike. Yeah and um, giving smaller classes to less experienced teachers um, gives them an opportunity to really play out best teaching as we know it in a, in a manageable way. Right. I think it's a great way to go. All right, so let's talk about some more of the nitty gritty in terms of if, if we were gonna try to do some of this or, or schools were gonna experiment, what are some of the implementation issues that they've got to think through? I mean, for example, 
pretty obvious that uh, you don't want to create a perverse incentive here, right? Uh, you've done a great job, uh, Miss Johnson, and we're going to reward you by giving you 10 more kids next year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that does not seem like that's going to be such a good strategy. So what are some of those things, as you've thought about this a lot, Mike, and we'll get the others in here, that, that we need to kind of the design issues that we need to worry about? Okay, so aside from that perverse incentive, uh, where we don't want to discourage the effective teachers, we also don't want to discourage, say, a teacher who may, may be an average teacher, and that's fine. But uh, let's say that average teacher would have had a class, even under this strategic class, sign, class assignment strategy, is still going to have an average size classroom. So they're not going to get the, an extra five kids, mm -hmm. but they're just going to stick at 20 or whatever they were. Because the, the or less... Or 25 or 30. I'm just waiting for the tweets out there to say, <laughs> who's got a class of 20? Give me a break. Right. OK, so, so the, where, because perhaps the average teacher is the third or fourth teacher in the grade, yep. and there, there is a less effective teacher who has lower, a lower class size. So we don't want to create this perverse incentive where the average teachers who aren't getting the larger classes or aren't getting this benefit, but we don't want to encourage them to start you know, working less and in order to get a smaller class, because this is a smaller class is an increase in their working conditions, we might think. Okay. And so if that's an increase in their working conditions, there should be some kind of you know, compensation or benefit associated with that. And so, if we're, um, so perhaps we have to think about how we, we would prevent people from intentionally shirking. That's what we, we economists call it. Intentional shirking. Intentional the, shirking. Uh, the, 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 Linda, I know that you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. that's just offensive. Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, penalty box for Mike. No, all right. Nobody, put him in the penalty yeah, box. I mean, um, first of all, I, I'm sort of bothered by this whole idea of ranking. And if we're going to continue to rank teachers, there's going to be a whole bunch of people that are going to be in the middle statistically. But right. you can't. We can't get around that. And um, what does it mean to be? in the middle. Yeah. Um, uh, and the, the implication, and I, I don't want to hammer this too hard, Mike, because I don't think that's really what you meant, that anybody who goes into this profession would in any way shirk their responsibility to children um, in order to get a, a larger class size. Let's not, let's just like take that off the table. That, yeah. That's all right, and now you, and, but you've got, and, and you've made some points before about the actual value-added model that Mike is using here, right? Which is quite sophisticated, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not just trying to stroke your ego, but uh, no, but you're able to do things with these data that many states are not doing, right? In terms of being able to level the playing field for uh, teachers that might have uh, be teaching a lot of high-need students, for example, uh, is tell me if I'm getting that right. Uh, in a way that you know is is fair in terms of judging teacher quality, but a lot of states aren't doing. And so there's, I mean, that that's one of the considerations, right? Is you know what we really have to pay a lot of attention to what these metrics are. That if we are going to try to identify our best teachers, we better make sure that we're using the best technology to do that. All right, and uh, and, and I think you would agree that it certainly shouldn't just be test scores, right? That, that these larger evaluations. Are yes, I I do have some concerns though. I think Mike's model is is impressive in its sophistication, and I don't think your average principal um, is a statistician to that degree. But my concern is then when you start mixing in other metrics, um, a lot of times those aren't so great either, especially if you're talking about school districts who are t have an evaluation system that um, the evaluators don't have to be certified, that there's no inter-rater reliability. There's a really high subjectivity there. So, right. I mean, this is all of a piece, isn't yeah, it? It is. And, and one, one puzzle piece can't move without affecting another puzzle piece. Yeah. Maybe, but what, and I understand that, that there's an urgency to put kids in front of the best teachers, but really shouldn't the conversation be about elevating the profession in some way so that all kids are in front of the best teachers instead of systems that continue to silo teachers. If we're talking about giving the best teachers more kids, how does that break them out of their silo and help them improve all the teachers in their building? Yeah, what about that, Brian? I mean, we're, we're still talking about scarcity, right? There's only so many good teachers to go around or great teachers, and so we're doing all of this gymnastics to figure out who should get them. Yep. No, I just couldn't agree more with Linda. I, mean, I think, I think we, as long as we think about this as ranking and sorting and just then having a, 
a few teachers that are great and kind of held out and getting some kind of benefit, that's the wrong path to go down. But what if we thought of this as how can we use new configurations to dramatically improve the quality of the profession so it's much more attractive to people, much more retentive of great, of great teachers? And I think you, if you think that way, then this could benefit kids because they could have more access to great teachers. But teachers could also benefit from a, a totally different kind of career where if we think about how could these models create savings that can be used to pay teachers more, if we could think about how they could create career paths that teachers can progress along without leaving teaching while continuing to teach, that could make the profession a lot more attractive. And in the Charlotte work that we're doing where the district has said we're going to try these kind of models in, in half the schools over the next three years, they're able to pay teacher leaders $23,000 above the salary schedule out of the savings that the models create. And that, that led them to get 700 applications for the 19 jobs, so it really changes the calculations. And those teachers are leading other teachers, so it's not just setting them aside on a pedestal as being great. It's saying, let's put great teachers to work helping other teachers. Let's pay them more for doing right. that. To elevate the profession, as you right. said. But Brian, how does this work in, in a place like Charlotte when you have this mandate now to do these teacher evaluations? Thank you, Arnie Duncan. Uh, that, that basically assume the old model, that we've got a teacher in front of 25 kids and we're going to see her impact on their test scores. It, it creates some complications. I think state policy ideally would morph to, to support a lot of new models. In the meantime, Charlotte is, is, is managing to work within the system. They've added some evaluation metrics for these new roles. There's ways within the, the North Carolina system of dividing kids up among teachers okay. and giving different responsibility for okay. kids to different people. So they can work with so that. It's, it's not ideal. Yeah. yeah, but it's workable. What, what, what do you think, Jean-Claude? I mean, because you do see that some of these well-intentioned, I would argue, uh, reforms, uh, they don't always fit well together in this jigsaw puzzle. So what do we do? I, I think the mistake often is when you try to create these kinds of top-down uh, sort of uh, very rigid structures, but go back to, to the school level. I think you can have both. The, the idea of, of, of knowing who the best teachers are, I think, is important. And we have to create tools. We are creating tools to find out what those things are. Um, and, and we don't always put our best doctors in the emergency room, meaning teachers in the emergency room. So allowing and training a school leader to do that properly, I think, is important. Third thing is that very often the class cap, um, when I was a teacher, was 34 for my classroom, was often arbitrary. Um, so imagine that being based on solid research to understand what the tipping point is and when you have too many, right? And if you strategically place, say, a new teacher or one that's struggling around a few master teachers on the same floor in the same content area, then you can have that kind of teaming that you're looking for to develop people. But, but, but this, I think, I think has the potential, one, to talk about the structures that we need to create the best classrooms in, 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 in our schools. Second, what principals need to know in creating an, an amazing master schedule to serve the needs of all uh, within in their particular building. But it can, it can be done and based on solid information. Right, but, it's, but, but you're saying it's, we certainly should not have a new federal policy or state policy that mandates that people do this sort of thing, right? I mean, this is something that we should think about the barriers to it. Yes. Maybe say people, hey, if you want to try this, you know, you can apply for a waiver from the class size caps or from this teacher evaluation requirement, or maybe encourage charter schools that may already have some of those freedoms to, to do this. I mean, Brian, are you finding an interest among the charter sector in a lot of the kinds of reforms that you've been encouraging? They seems like they could do this tomorrow without much difficulty. I think there's quite a bit of ferment in the charter sector with new staffing models. You, everybody's heard of Rocket Ship. There are numerous schools using blended learning to try and change staffing configurations. So I see there's a fair bit of ferment in the charter sector. There are fewer constraints, and I think we'll see a lot of innovation there. But there's a real potential to do more in the, in the district sector because of just the sheer scale and the number of kids that are there. Great. Mike, if you go back to thinking about, again, um, what we have to do to get the right tools in the hands of the right person, right, or persons. And I keep going back to, to this one thing about the principal teacher in our building, the, the, the school leader, who has to get all that he or she needs to create an amazing co constellation of people in and around her to, to teach young, young people. So we have so many rules and structures in place that don't allow that to happen very easily. This, I think, opens the door for this kind of conversation around compensation, mm -hmm. around differential pay, around support, right, around uh, arbitrary class sizes, frankly. So this, I think, has the potential to, again, have that kind of robust dialogue about how you create the best schools 
for our, for our kids, mm -hmm. especially our neediest kids. Right. And, and you know, again, creating that, that, that space for that in many places, that's going to mean having a conversation with the teachers' unions exactly. and maybe uh, changing the contract or carving out some flexibility within that. I mean, any, any of these places you're working with, Brian, have collective bargaining agreements or you all you work mostly in right-to-work states? How, how is that working? Charlotte and Nashville don't. Uh, we've, we've, Syracuse, New York has a grant from the state to do some work related to this, and that's a place where the, there's a collective bargaining agreement. So we'll see how that plays out. Yeah. E even in the right-to-work states, a lot of the same, same policies and constraints exist. There's still seniority-based assignments, still bumping policies, yeah. still various issues, and, and there's still class size constraints. There's still funding inflexibility. So it's, it's not as different as you might think. All right, let, let's talk about the equity piece, uh, and then we're going to get uh, everybody else in this conversation. So you make it very clear, Mike, that, uh, that this doesn't solve the problem, that, that high-need schools tend to have more low-performing teachers than the wealthier schools do. All right, and first of all, help us understand the research on this, because I feel like I've read conflicting studies. I mean, we always assumed for a long time that there was this teacher quality gap. And if you looked at traditional credentials and where people went to college, things like that, you would certainly see a gap where the, the highest poverty schools seem to have uh, you know, less qualified teachers. But then some data seemed to start coming out on value added that said, well, maybe these gaps aren't actually so big. Uh, and isn't it all about how you measure value added? So can you help just e explain that to us? What, what do we know right now about the, the magnitude of those gaps? OK, sure. So uh, to begin, uh, your, your perception was, was correct in that Based on typical credentials, if we're talking about experience, if we're talking about master's degrees, uh, the percentage of certified personnel, et cetera, those, me those proportions are much higher in more affluent schools. Okay? So, and, so, and those gaps between the affluent schools and the, the, more, the schools serving higher poverty student uh, populations, those gaps are pretty significant. However, the recently, more recent studies in the past uh, five or six years, as they've They've begun to connect the dots between value added and credentials, and what they see is that there's actually these credentials don't do a great deal of prediction about how you're going to actually perform in the classroom. Right. And they say, well, what if we actually just looked at performance in the classroom? What do those, those distributions of teachers look like? And so what we see, we still do see a gap. There is a gap in in teaching and teacher quality between. Uh, the high poverty schools and more affluent schools, but that gap's not nearly as large as many have believed. So for instance, I was uh, involved in this, uh, this IES study that recently came out, um, and we're, we were looking at 29 school districts and looking at the effective teaching gap in those districts, and it was there, it was statistically significant, but uh, the, the uh, gap was on the order of 3% of a student standard deviation in these subjects. So it's, it's still, it's, it's, significant, but it's much larger, or excuse me, it's much smaller than the actual change in teacher quality that you'd see even within the same school. And, and how do you deal with this perception, or, and, or is it a fact, that it is simply harder to raise test scores or get stronger value-added gains for high-poverty kids? I mean, that, that you see some value-added models, take that as a given, and so they, you know, they, they do some some statistical stuff to kind of level the playing field is again is this just an artifact of how we're measuring it or do you do you really think that in a real way we tend to have higher performing teachers in the affluent schools than in the high poverty schools okay so what you're getting at here is truly from what we could tell so far an unknowable answer it's an unknowable question okay at this point and so um, if we're looking at if we're comparing teachers who are serving similar populations of students, mm -hmm. then we can it's it's we can make a comparison between those teachers relatively easily. Mm -hmm. But when we're talking about very different student populations, we can control for uh, say your free or reduced price lunch status, or um, or the fact that these students are on special ed, or um, or you know limited English proficiency, et cetera. We can control all these different factors. The problem is, is that we don't know if the model is over-controlling or under-controlling for these things. Mm -hmm. And so when we're comparing across very different populations, it's really hard to, to truly say if the teachers in the better school or in the more affluent schools are actually better teachers, which may be true, mm -hmm. or whether it's, it's just simply the, the, the fact of statistical sorting. We don't truly know that issue. But if we're talking about comparing same teachers within the same classes, it's uh, it's pretty clear. Now, now we do it, within that uh, that study I was just describing a minute, a few moments ago. 
about the uh, effective teaching gap in 29 school districts. We do our, our best to try to sort all those issues out. And the, the model that we kind of end up with at the end of the day, it, it, it says that th that's the one that says, you know, about 3% of students okay. standard deviation. They, uh, they might want you to be uh, to testify for the defense out there in California, because <laughs> uh, I believe some of the testimony from Tom Kane and others was that these, these gaps are real. Uh, and, and by the way, maybe the message to someone like Arne Duncan, who is thinking about regulating in a very uh, you know, you know, top-down way on this teacher distribution issue, is that we don't even really know for sure if there is a teacher distribution problem or not. Uh, and if we do think that if it exists, it's, it's quite small. So uh, perhaps caution is, uh, well, well, is called for. Well, it's, it's still significant. So it's not, it's not to say that it's not there. But it is, it is still there, so okay. uh, it's, Brian, it's worth, worth noting. All right, you, you, the, the, the defense rests. Okay, Brian. Yes. <laughs> Even if caution may be, may be warranted, I think there's no reason why we shouldn't have a lot more transparency of the data. Yeah. Like I think that what Mike showed us about what percent of kids have excellent teachers uh, and being about 25 percent, that, that's not readily a, available in, in any kind of data set that a state would post. But what if states asked districts and schools to report what percent of your students have an excellent teacher, a highly effective teacher, whatever the term is, in charge of their instruction as their teacher of record? Not just what percent of the teachers are highly effective, but what percent of the kids have those teachers in charge of their instruction? That could be incredibly illuminating and compelling, because then you might see some districts are doing a better job than others of, of doing what Mike's talking about or some of these other models. And it might, if there were also consequences attached to that, it could be, it could be compelling to, to Wouldn't wouldn't that transparency also lead to a lot of fist fights? Back, back to our hockey team, uh, as uh, parents uh, fight over these uh, scarce resources. This is, all right, so, uh, but, but the point from this study is that even if we make these changes within these schools and change the staffing models, it is not fundamentally gonna change this picture between schools, uh, which is obvious, because that's not what this reform, uh, particular reform is trying to get at. All right, I want to get uh, you into this conversation as well as those people at home. Keep in mind, if you want to ask a question on Twitter, just send it to the hashtag teacher access. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question here, go ahead and raise your hand, and we will uh, get a microphone to you so people at home can hear you. Let's get started right here with Mike uh, from IEL. And just hold that mic up close and tell us who you are. A mic on the mic, okay. Um, Mike Easday on the Institute for Educational Leadership. I'd like to ask a question, particularly relating to North Carolina, in terms of the role of the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. Because this is the one certification mechanism in the country that has had the support of both the NEA and the AFT. And the numbers are still minimal nationally. Only perhaps 3% of the teachers in the United States are board certified. It's a little over 100,000 now. But in North Carolina, due to the efforts of Jim Hunt in the initial years of the National Board, I believe almost 20% of the teachers are board certified. And Brian, particularly in Charlotte, in other words, North Carolina probably has the largest percentage of board certified teachers. How does the National Board enter into this equation and into this discussion? Because it seems to me it's a political asset <laughs> because you have the you have the backing of the unions. If any of this stuff is going to be sustainable, yeah. All right. So, so I mean, the larger question is: Have have any of the teacher groups, including the unions or the national board, gotten involved? Linda's in a little bit of a funny spot in that she is now actually working for the national board, but not representing them here today. So, I'm actually going to ask Brian to answer that. If if you know in Charlotte, uh, if if national board teachers have been a part of these efforts or uh, how that has been playing out. You're right, North Carolina has been on the forefront of this. But I think, what, I think what North Carolina and most states haven't done as well a job of is saying once we've identified someone as a national board teacher, what do we do, what do, we do with that? It's, it's a great recognition. There's compensation attached to it in North Carolina. But, but are we then taking advantage of that to, to help other teachers get better or help more students improve, improve their learning? And I think the potential exists in a place that has a lot of national board certified teachers for them to step into these roles that we're talking about creating, but that hasn't been an explicit part of the, of the conversation in, in North Carolina yet. Okay. Mike, I, I, would, I would agree, even in Chicago where the CTU was a big part of our work with national boards, we never really developed a structure to leverage these folks as much as we could have, right? But, so that, much more needs to be done there. 
Linda? I just throw out a little plug and say that um, the National Board is also revising mm -hmm. um, the current structure to become a National Board Certified Teacher is, going, is in the middle of revision and we're looking for teachers to pilot. So if anybody is interested in piloting, you can just go on to the National Board website. You can be a retired teacher, a current teacher, a principal, whatever. But I th I'm hoping that the 3.0 revisions, um, which will change the process significantly and allow teachers to spread the process longer, will start to help move teachers towards certification because I believe it is a, a premier benchmark. And, and of course, that was the vision, right? I mean, I remember Al Bill Shanker. Clinton and Al, you know, Al Shanker, Bill Clinton, others saying, we want to have one of these national board certified teachers in every classroom, I mean, every, every uh, school in America that could then help the other teachers improve their craft as well. Now, uh, I, and, and so this is kind of coming, you know, a little bit full circle. Yeah. So on, on national board certified teachers, actually, we do have, because this was based on North Carolina data, and um, I've, I've actually done a study on national board certified teachers in the past. And in and uh, in North Carolina, the this credential national board certification looks like the distribution of all the other credentials, which is they generally tend to be um, most concentrated in the more affluent schools. And so it's similar to experience or similar to holding a master's degree, just as I, as I described before. And so um, now, if we were to if we if um, equality were an issue, and we wanted specifically to have more of those National Board Certified Teachers in the classrooms of, of needy students, then we'd have to ha do some kind of additional targeting beyond what the state has done. So the state has, I think they had a 12% um, salary increase in place for a while. I don't know if it's still the case now. But, uh, but before it was not, tar it, it, from what I'm aware, it was not targeted at all. So, so many teachers would actually, even from the needier schools, they would they would get a national board certification. It becomes a signal of their quality, and they would use it to actually move to an affluent school. That was what the what what the evidence that we found before. Now, now, Brian, you know, when you're talking about these new roles, though, I mean, couldn't some people look at this and say, you know, we are now adding all these costs in these sort of non-classroom teachers. In fact, Matt Richmond, my colleague, I called out earlier for his great idea on, uh, you know, making this more about experienced teachers versus less experienced teachers. He has a paper coming out on this explosive growth of, of non-teaching personnel that we've seen over the last 30 years, instructional coaches and all these people that are on the payroll who aren't exactly in front of kids and that that's where a lot of our increased spending has been. I mean, is that, to a lot of people that feels like bloat and bureaucracy and waste. I mean, what, what do you say to them? Well, I think we're just responding to that. That's been the, over the last 40 years, that's what we've done. What we're saying in, the, in these schools and these models is, Let's stop doing that. Let's stop adding personnel that aren't responsible for students that are outside of classrooms. And let's have those folks, if they are great teachers, come into these roles as multi-classroom leaders where they are teaching kids every day, where they're working with individual teachers every day. And in Charlotte, a lot of these positions have been filled by those folks moving into these more direct classroom roles mm -hmm. and then not replacing them. And that's one of the sources of savings that they're using to pay teachers more. Teacher pay has been pretty much flat for 40 years while average per pupil spending has been going like this. Let's invest more in the teachers who are kind of on the line getting the job done. Great. Okay, Barbara, let's uh, get you in here. Don't forget, tweet me your questions to, at teacher access. If somebody could also tweet me the score of the hockey game, that'd be great. All right, to, uh, <laughs> well, wait, hold on, hold on. They can't hear you at home without it. <laughs> Barbara Davidson with Common Core. I guess I have the question, Michael, about where selection comes in to student selection and wondering whether or not it's really realistic. I mean, I'm assuming that the model is based on random selection of that's students. Right. And I guess I'm wondering how realistic that is because that's not really how we assign students to classes anyway. Mm -hmm. So I just would be interested in your commenting about what you think happens to the model as you contemplate that. Yeah, so that's a very fair question. And just because in order to keep the simulation tractable, I only varied the quantity of students across classrooms, and I did not vary the quality of students, which is the selection issue that you're dealing with. And so I, I think that's sort of an interesting dimension that we could consider and, and think about. Um, you know, so for, for students maybe that have behavioral problems, would it be better, you know, to, to leave those in the smaller classes? But if we're leaving them in the smaller classes with the less effective teachers, what does that, 
you know, what, what implications does that have? I think that's, those are a lot of interesting conversations. For the purpose of, of the paper, I, I had to just abstract it away from that entirely. But I think it's, I think it's great, and I think it, we really, if, as we begin to experiment with these things, I think that's a really important dimension we need to really think about clearly. Okay, right here in front. On my. As far as I can tell, it's tied zero zero right now. But uh, let me know if that, that sounds does that sound right. So see, you're not missing anything. Another Barbara, Barbara Cambridge from the National Council of Teachers of English. I was interested to hear the panel uh, each respond similarly in, um, about um, flexibility. And John claude you said it needs to be um, school leaders and teachers working together. And Linda, you said it needs to be teachers thinking about proper grouping or, or appropriate grouping. And you mentioned teacher design teams. The implication of that is that a teacher will be more effective, an educator will be more effective, if the person can work in teams in that kind of decision making. And that's not a part now of teacher evaluation at all. Do you have examples or uh, ideas about how to get that kind of role for educators part of the evaluation system? First of all, I mean, do we think that's, I wonder if that is true, that this, the issues around teamwork are not part of teacher evaluations. I suspect in some places that that is at least one of the criteria. But, um, but what do you think? I mean, is this something, as you, Brian, maybe, as you've seen this play out in these places, doing things differently, are these the kinds of changes they want to make to their teacher evaluation systems? Yes, I think, I think there is teamwork built into some evaluations. Uh, that's more common than you might think. Team leadership, maybe less so. That's the, some of the revisions that we made to the evaluation rubric in Charlotte for the pilot schools was to make sure that your role as a leader was being evaluated well. So I think there's more to be done there. But it's, it's important. I would think any district that wants to think about these kinds of things really ought to look at their evaluation rubric and ask, are we evaluating based on what we're actually going to be asking teachers to, to do in their daily work or not? Mm -hmm. Pretty important. Okay, let's go in the front again to Fritz. Sorry that I hit you in the head, Mike. <laughs> nope, that's fine. Well, well, that's fine. We'll start back there and we'll get you next, Fritz. Well, first of all, Michael, thank you for asking a question that needed to be asked, and I'm going to ask another one. Uh, but first, uh, quoting uh, Ken Blanchard, who wrote The One Minute Manager, a management guru many years ago, he said, if you want good people, you got three choices. He says, hire them, develop them, or pray. <laughs> um, and maybe there's some trade-offs here about what would be the most cost-effective way of, of getting the best teachers in the classroom. And maybe John claude knows where I'm going with the first issue, hire the, the best people the first time. There is a protocol called the Haberman Protocol. I'm Barry Stern. I repre I, I'm affiliated with the Haberman Foundation. I know you used it in Rochester. Used it in Rochester. But uh, that, that having the people who have the gumption and the grit and the persistence to succeed and persist with urban students is probably a, a very cost-effective way to go. Now, in terms of uh, developing them, uh, I've spent a fair amount of my, my life uh, I training. I should say we, we want this to lead okay. quickly to a question. OK, well, let me, I'll, I'll skip the development part, but go back to the concept of the factory model school, which I think Linda mentioned. Um, and Barb was talking about uh, team, te teamwork. Uh, there's a small room of maybe five people, ten people, who know that believe that teaching is a team sport, not only after school, but in real time, where teachers of different disciplines are in the room at the same time with large groups of kids uh, running kind of a three-ring circus. And, and here our assumption is that class size is something that's a static thing within the context of a factory model with one teacher for one class. Uh, how would you do this? If all of a sudden we had more blended learning kinds of things, larger classes, different sizes of the, what's the met, what are some of the methodological issues that would, would get at? Uh, I happen to believe, having done this myself uh, with an NSF grant to have a team teaching yep. kind of a model, okay. uh, and I got two or three grade levels in two months. But how do you how would you assess that? So I guess the question. I mean, we, so we've talked some about this already today, right? That uh, that. We want to go beyond just shifting the numbers, and we want to think about completely different models of grouping throughout the day. 
But then how would you actually figure out if that's effective or not, or what pieces of that are effective? Maybe is, is that even important? I mean, do we need to worry about the individual impact of individual teachers so much? I, I would argue that if we're, to, if we're going towards that kind of model, perhaps evaluating individual teachers may not be nearly as, as uh, an important a criterion. You know, perhaps then we're just evaluating the system. And so in that case, if the system is at a grade level, say, then let's evaluate the grade level and see how the grade level is performing and if they're do doing well and if they're meeting their goals. But, uh, but generally speaking, I think, at least as of right now, in most places, the, the classroom factory model, I think, is, is generally the, the, the um, practice that we have. And so as of right now, I think it makes sense to evaluate teachers based on that context. But uh, if we're going to change the context, yeah, we should think about changing how we evaluate it. So it makes me wonder um, if these evaluation systems are locking us in yeah. to a factory yeah, yeah. model yeah, when, um, when we know that things have changed. I, if I can steal from, steal from Will Richardson, um, we're no longer in an information scarce world. You have this little thing that can get you anything you need to know. Right. The question is, what's the quality of that information, and what are you going to do with it? Right. So um, I don't stand in front of my classes and lecture anymore. M my kids are act have to be active learners. And the, the fact that information is available leads us to these different paths. If a kid needs to get here, there's multiple ways for getting that kid there based on interest and readiness. Um, and I'm not sure that this individual teacher evaluation model is in any way helpful to the real world that we live in right now. No, and, and there have been folks, I mean, Rick Hess has been saying this for probably five years, is that these teacher evaluation models are, are definitely constraining, especially things like blended learning, but any, any kind of... Just saying I just agreed with Rick. You agree <laughs> with Rick Hess. Would you like to reconsider your position on no, this? No, no. <laughs> Mike, Mike, just, just want to add, I mean, perhaps we're, we're thinking about this the, the, the wrong way. So we keep using the words evaluation system. It should be a development system, right? So if you have these multiple criteria, like a good framework, it, it targets you where the weaknesses are, and your job is to develop that person, right? Um, so instead of talking about how we use this as, as a hammer, let's talk about how we use a system to actually elevate a profession and develop people and identify in an objective way, perhaps, who the great ones are. Because what was before wasn't exactly great. Budget was, was tacit. Um, the system I use as a principal in New York City was a checklist, right? In the end, you give the person an S. You have no idea what that meant, frankly, right? Uh, but now you have tools that perhaps can help you identify the areas you've got to work with, with people, and, and perhaps have the right kind of touch points. If that person's top 25%, let's make sure that person has an impact on the rest of the school and the rest of the kids in the system, however we define or do it, actually. I, I think that's Angela. Is it Minucci? Is that how you say her last name? From AI? Yeah, yeah Minucci. The, Minucci. That's her model, right? It's a, it's a circle where the, everything's based on the common core, you have teacher evaluation, but then PD feeds back into exactly. that. Mm -hmm. So it's this constant loop that we're, that we're going through. It's a feedback loop. Exactly. All right. Next question. Charlie, did you have a, one that you want? But let's get Charlie in here. Now, Charlie, I know you're a big fan of teacher evaluations, and uh, sometimes we have these debates. You know, there's this debate right now. There's a great post today about common core and teacher evaluations being on a collision course. I'm happy to throw teacher evaluations under the bus. Sometimes I think Charlie's happy to throw Common Core under the bus. So uh, are you going to go to the penalty box today or what? Uh, go ahead, Charlie. They're both what I would call distal variables, right? Like they're not the thing that's going to impact change. They're a tool for other things ah, to change. Okay. So, um, that's how you feel. Let's throw your preferred reform under the bus. Um, I'm thinking uh, th a question for the panel is what are you seeing in your work? Uh, and I guess this is... Um, particularly for Brian and, and less so the simulation model, but feel free to jump in. In terms of developing the capacity of systems to sustain these types of things, I mean, one of the things that's her inherent, at, whether you're talking about Orny Duncan or you're talking about the district, is everybody's coming in to have a district do something. And then everybody agrees that certain flexibility needs to be built into that. At a certain point, you all leave. Brian, you leave. You all leave, you know. Yeah. What, I'm in a little trouble when I hear, for example, that a, a principal can't understand a correlation. 
Like that's stats 101 in undergraduate, let alone in a master's program. So <clears throat> I didn't see anything beyond a correlation or an XY chart in your presentation. Right, well, let, let's and so what, how do you let's build the capacity of a system it. to do these things and then carry them out over time to be flexible enough to be smart enough to yeah. change them as needed over time? And by the way, I think what Linda was referring to was really the VAM model itself, right? I mean, My which is incredibly sophisticated. My particular model, which right. is really much more sophisticated yeah. than most VAM models that are out there. Right. Okay, so so Brian, I mean, you're. I think it's early days in this work that you have, but you must be thinking about this. How does this get sustained, and isn't just the fad du jour? Well, I think I think districts have system change work to do, and and states do as well. Uh, I think the way it gets sustained is, and the way we see it playing out is, the teachers are going to sustain it because they're going to be able to earn more and have more impact and have a better working life, and they're not going to want to take it away. But I think those systems need to change, too, to make it possible. So at the district level, it's a different compensation structure. It's a different evaluation structure, perhaps, as we've been saying. It's a different hiring uh, mechanism, because you need different people to take mm -hmm. on these different roles. So there's a lot of change needed there that has to be encoded. But then at the state level, there's a, a, often a lot of constraints that make it hard for districts to make these changes. So for example, we talked about class size limits, but also the way funding systems often work uh, make it difficult for districts to say, let's change our staffing configuration, mm -hmm. use the savings then to pay teachers more for taking on these roles. And so states also have to rethink their policies. Right. And then even if you get some one-off agreements with the state, it's always something that can be undone as people leave. It's, uh, th this is what makes our, our governance system such a, such a challenge uh, in any of these kinds of reforms. By the way, goal! U.S. is up 1-0. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's do uh, one more question. Uh, yes, back there, Howard. Uh, let's get the mic over to him. Tell us who you are and ask your question. Uh, Howard Nelson, AFT. I have a question for Michael. First, a compliment on the paper. It was very well documented. On the issue of the 10 days, um, doesn't that really mean 10 hours since math is taught making this assumption one hour a day. Mm -hmm. um, and the other people that, that use that translation say days as well, but it really means the proportion of a day that that subject is taught, correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct, yes. So, so yeah, that, that would, uh, if we're speaking in, the, in terms of the periods of the day, then yes, they'd only be receiving an additional one period of math instruction per day, so yeah about 10 hours of additional work from what we could tell. Yep, right. So that, that's an important, uh, important thing to mm -hmm. consider. Yeah. Which makes you wonder, are there other ways we could gain that time back um, mm -hmm. uh, with, before we even start moving teachers? What are ways we could gain back three hours, right. maybe less test prep? Mm -hmm. Well, that was our last event. We, uh, we should have you there for that. But, but yeah, but this would be on, on multiple, um, just to clarify, this would be, it, it, this would be uh, additional days on, on this, from the student's perspective, this is an additional period, but for the teacher who's teaching those additional classes, that's um, 10 additional days of classes that she's teaching now three or four additional periods, right? So in the total outcome that, yeah, for, for the eighth grade teacher. So the total additional output is uh, the number of classes she's teaching times the number of periods she's teaching it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, first of all, I think it's very clear from this conversation that, that there is promise in ideas like this, um, that there's interest in experimenting, uh, not just, again, this narrow slant at uh, how many kids in a classroom, but this much broader issue of just really thinking about the way that we staff, that we group, uh, making that much more flexible uh, throughout the day, but that there are some real barriers to doing so. Uh, and some of those barriers have been around for a long time and have built in the system, and some of those barriers, frankly, are, are the fault of reformers uh, who have been pushing things like these teacher evaluation systems, uh, which may be locking the old system into place. And so we have got to have much more flexibility, a much more nimble approach, uh, so that schools that want to try something different uh, can do so. And that's something that we've got to figure out. Um, and uh, in all that said, even if we help schools figure out these changes to staffing within them, that doesn't solve this larger issue of the distribution challenge, of the teacher effectiveness gap, which 
may or may not exist, probably does exist, is significant, might be relatively small, but is not something that we can ignore either. Is that fair that, that's, that's summation? Fair. Fair. All right, good. Please join me in thanking our gold medal panel here today for a great conversation. Uh, I do hope that you will both read Mike's paper, if you haven't already, that you'll tell your friends about this panel. It is going to be available just about immediately for people to watch after the fact. Go in, read the uh, Twitter feed, which was a lot of fun. I, I appreciate, Linda, that your handle is Linguini, uh, which I think is awesome. Uh, and, uh, and keep participating in this very important conversation. And stay tuned for Fordham's uh, next event, which will be coming up next month. Uh, thanks again to AIR for co-hosting, and thank you for being here. Bye-bye.